Hey, I know you. Hello, everyone. This is Everfree Radio. My name is Final Draft. I will be your host for the program, and I am here with Brush and Bones. Hi there, Brush and Bones here. Here's my fellow co-host, Crescendo. And another of our co-hosts, Autumn Spice. Hey there. This episode was recorded on Sunday, October 16th. Okay, so before we dive into the program, as it were, let's first discuss what is Everfree Radio and why are we on the internet? I'll go ahead and answer that question. Everfree Radio is going to be a compilation podcast by We The Fans that's going to highlight all aspects of the fandom and the show itself. you got a lot of shows out there or a lot of uh, podcasts that tend to highlight only the most well-known or popular stuff, and they focus a lot on getting, getting to talk with the people of the show and stuff like that, and they tend to forget the little guy. We here at Everfree Radio, we plan on covering everything from art to music to fan fiction to fan animation to the show itself we're going to cover the biggest names and the littlest names the good the bad and the ugly in this fandom we're rooting for the underdogs because you never know where you might find a gem in the fandom all right so as you all know uh just yesterday lesson zero was released and it was a very fun episode Twilight Sparkle had a bit of a mental breakdown, and the understatement of the century was made in the episode synopsis, where it said that she had panic. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> panic does not do this justice. It doesn't do it justice. I have to say, when I you know read that synopsis, I thought this was going to be a bottle episode. I thought it was going to be rather, you know subdued and i thought it would just be something simple and when you started seeing her eyes twitch and the main start going i i was surprised by this episode i really was in all honesty there was a time there was a point at which at this episode during twilight uh slip into insanity that i was honestly saying to myself this out and i'm sure that there are people who will disagree with me but i personally thought this outdoes the sanity slippage of Pinkie pie in party of one i gotta disagree i completely agree i've got to disagree <laughs> i've got to disagree and, and all right you go first I, i'll give you my reasons why and then and then you can prove me wrong um i think that you know it's a different kind of sanity slippage but i just would point out that Pinkie pie was giving a sack of flour a french accent and turning a stack of rocks into rock. <laughs> you didn't get that kind of, but now that being said, that being said, I'm not going to deny that Twilight was was beyond insane in this episode. Okay, but was Pinkie Pie going into children's beach balls and then <laughs> jumping out and being like, hey, girls, <laughs> hey, take my doll. <laughs> in all honesty, I think that Pinkie Pie, yes, she had a a psychotic break, but I think Twilight is scarier. Um, Maybe it's less expected. From a writing perspective, that's it is two different forms of psychosis in this case, because Twilight's was born of her OCD and her desire to please her teacher and be that perfect student. She couldn't stand the idea of being tardy, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so uh, that being the case, her form of insanity is quite a bit different from Pinky's, where Pinky's was insanity born of loneliness. So she crafted herself a few friends of her own, uh, as <laughs> as we saw with. Madame Lafleur and Rocky and Mr. Turnip, <laughs> but um, oh, and Sir Lancelot. That's right. Him. But, How could um, you forget him? My goodness, he's the most important of the four. Un under most understated background character. Oh God! Of but, course. Uh, in this particular instance, since her insanity was born of trying to trying to make sure she could stay a good student and there wasn't any problem to solve, she decided to make one. Uh, kind of like, uh, in, in all honesty, I laughed because when she said, if I can't find a problem, I'll just make one. 
uh, it reminded me of the scene from uh, the the story How the Grinch Stole Christmas when yep. he looks at his dog evilly and says, "If I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead." I actually suspect that they drew upon that as like as inspiration for the show because I mean that grin. That grin. The grin, yeah, that's what I was about to say. The facial expressions. The, the expressions she has on her face. And when she, she not only, not, oh, God, and we, uh, another good thing that this episode is, aside from the insanity and, and stuff like that, um, we finally got to see Twilight start using her teleportation magic again. Because yes. everyone yeah. was pretty curious yeah. as to why in the heck she wasn't using it more often in season one. But we have found out she can do it at will. She uses it to go inside and explode out of the cutie mark crusaders beach ball maybe between seasons one and two she just had a little more practice that's one way to look at it <laughs> not only that but she abuses it she um <laughs> i think that the more uh panicked she got the more powerful her magic got i thought it was kind of an interesting reversal of roles in that scene too i mean the cutie mark crusaders are usually the crazy ones and twilight is usually the voice of reason they were really subdued in this episode the cutie mark crusaders were literally they weren't even trying to do some hardcore crusading they were just playing with a beach ball nowhere near the beach (laughs) mind you but they were just playing with their beach ball yeah because um the further along the episode goes the more erratic twilight's magic becomes like Right at the end of her psychosis, she casts a spell that makes every pony in Pony oh, Girl God. fall in love with a doll called Smarty Pants. On the subject of that magic, thick fuel or what? We now know. We now know that Twilight is capable of using magic to make people fall in love with something. You know what I think? It's going to cause shipping. I think this calls for collective groan from the entirety of the Everfree staff because it is going to be terrible. Draft, you literally read my mind with that. I was thinking we just did a collective face palm. Yeah, yeah. Face hooves all around. I seriously, I seriously, when I saw the charm happen, I was like, and so the pens and the keyboards began to move in unison. I mean, can you imagine? That being said, though, they made it wasn't it canon. A, you know, okay, yeah, they made it they canon. They made it canon. Oh yeah, but I think though the uh, in terms of you know writing for the episode, separate from the fanon concerns, it was a good element to the episode. I don't it think they should have. It was definitely a fantastic element. Yeah, I mean, I loved it because it showed just how far Twilight was willing to stoop, what the levels of uh, uh, she was willing to go to ensure that she could find some way of creating a friendship related problem to pass to to basically pass a test that she herself had created oh speaking of which the, the return of trollestia yep as at the end of this episode not only does she dis- does princess celestia decide to grace all of the ponies in ponyville with her presence in a fantastic teleporting flourish of light and magic she acts like she's angry at Twilight. Then when she's scolding Twilight while her friends are are off still away, concerned for Twilight's well-being, she she makes it clear that she she wasn't expecting a letter every week on the day. And then when the friends come in, saying no, they can't that she can't take Twilight away and that it was their fault and they should have been better friends. She doesn't say, she doesn't say, oh. Uh, I was never going to punish her. I just needed to yeah. explain to her that she needed she needed to not take it so seriously. She acts like she's still mad. She gives them that look, that look like, and then she says, I'm listening. And then she says even worse than that. She goes, well, instead of your punishment, then she even uses the term. So, I mean, she clearly is playing with them there. But... Celestia truly upped the trolling ante since the time she tricked Mr. and Mrs. Cake into pouring tea into a full tea cup. Gotcha. Well, do you just see she was obviously, she feels like she got so one-upped by Discord that she has to work a little bit harder now. Well, and she phrases, she phrases her, she phrases her new, her new punishment, basically, in such a manner as to make it seem to the, the, the ponies beneath her that she has, um, that she has punished them further for, for not, for not helping Twilight by saying that they all need to give her homework. But then she tacks on at the end there that they need to give her, they all need to give her homework on the problems and, or the lessons of friendships when they discover them. 
which basically means there's no deadline. Though I will say, this is the first episode really where we see Celestia being more than just a happy free leader. She actually has to take some action. Uh, like yeah. She deals out a punishment. This is also the first time we see Celestia actually like, while it was presumed she might have teleported in the in the, in yep. the first season's two-parter, this is the first episode we see Celestia teleport. And dear God, does she need, does she need to make such a magnificent dynamic entry? The question is, could she do... Alicorn magic is now canon. Yeah, and not only that, but could she do any less, really? I mean, that's, that's just her. Mm-mm. She's Princess Celestia. She is the sun uh, the sun alicorn she is the sun mover she is the sun <laughs> goddess thank you autumn you brought up a point i really wanted to discuss which would be the animation error in this episode oh god oh god that is a gigantic ball of wax just gigantic yes. i just am amazed at how quickly the fandom caught on to this in the scene where Twilight is imagining, for people who have not caught this already or have not caught word of this already, it is all over the place. In the scene where Twilight is imagining herself back in Magic Kindergarten, um, there are a bunch of uh, unicorn fillies mocking her. But in the far back right of the classroom, there is a small, like, cream-colored filly with a purple mane and if you zoom in on this filly she has wings and a horn and she has this discovery that there was an alicorn filly purely an animation error mind you uh our sources good sources have said so themselves but uh purely an animation error mind you but this filly was seen and hoisted into the limelight of the fandom they already gave her a name they for uh, most most of the fandom right now is referring to her as pluto because that would make her the smallest celestial body and Ugh. very controversial <laughs> and there's also some controversy as to whether or not you know magic king garden that whole scene was a delusion or was it a memory and so people are like is this canon or not well, and yeah it's just since oh. she's since she's a full grown since she's clearly a full grown mare in her flat in the imagination spot getting laughed at at these fillies I'm pretty certain it's just supposed to be imagination spot and that was my assumption too you see a couple of fillies from the background cast in the classroom specifically you see Dinky Hooves and she lives in Ponyville if she was going to be going to Canterlot Magic Kindergarten that would mean she'd have to commute from Ponyville every day. Um, and now, uh, that being said, of course, background ponies, they get reused all the time oh, yeah. in all sorts of places. Right. But yeah. um, I kind of particularly, I see it more as a uh, an imagination spot where she's imagining herself in Philly kindergarten. And since she doesn't, since she doesn't, since she doesn't know any fillies in Canterlot right now, she fills the classroom with fillies she knows. Therefore, they're fillies from Ponyville. I think that in the end, reality is that, that the fandom is probably overthinking it. It was an animation error. It was never really that big of a deal, whether it was a memory or a, a delusion. I think given the entire episode, um, I'm assuming it's a delusion. The one thing I wanted to bring up to you before I completely forget to mention it is my favorite reference of the episode, which is the Lord of the Rings reference, where she's talking to her reflection, you know, that in the pool. Or, or even a, even even better reference for those of us who have played it. It might not even be a reference, but you cannot tell me that when Twilight saw those fillies playing. Uh, jump rope and then they suddenly turned the environment turned into this scary thing and they were suddenly these filly shades all laughing at her for those of you who are familiar with story of the blanks you cannot say that when you saw that scene you did not think oh my god it's story of the blanks i felt that i was i freaked out i was like this is like story of the blanks well and speaking of story of the blanks we're going to be doing a review of that for our next episode so everybody tune in for that I would also, though, point out that when they wrote the script and when they planned out the storyboarding, I think it was well, well, well before Story of the Blanks was even conceived as an idea 
But, Indeed. But it does just show that great minds think alike. It's a very fun connection to make either way. Going back to the classroom scene you guys brought up, um, one thing I thoroughly enjoyed about this episode is the continual breaking of the fall. The meta aspects were great. I liked how Spike would move the backgrounds. That was actually really good. It was incredibly subtle. It wasn't anything like, gee, I think somebody's watching us stare at the screen. No, it was rather subtle. It wasn't Pinkie Pie blatant. Yeah, it wasn't Pinkie Pie blatant. It was more just like, it was done in that sort of Looney Tunes-esque style of comedy where it's like when Twilight has her imagination spot and she's getting all super paranoid and nervous and panicky and Spike comes and he just rolls away the backdrop and they're back in the library. <laughs> Yeah. You can see that Spike has his own style of uh, fourth wall breaking. Yeah, he does. And it's really charming. Oh, yeah. And I'm also, uh, I think that Spike kind of deserved to toot his own horn a bit at the end of the episode when he starts to add to the letter that they're all writing to Princess Celestia. And he's saying, Spike, on the other hand, shouldn't have to do homework because unlike everyone else, he actually was taking it seriously and attempting to help. And there were probably... A bunch of fans that were saying because he is best pony oh god there were probably so many fans i honestly did hear it as because spike is best pony well, I this, did. you know yes. spike is the show's rag doll basically i mean in any given episode he's being abused um you look at the first one he gets hit by the door he gets flung from the ladder you know you oh, look at any of these the episodes cupcake, the cupcake frosting the cupcake frosting in this episode which was which was kind of like yeah he got bathed in it but then we we find out he's got a once again bringing up looney tunes reference the gigantic tongue which he uses to tasmanian devil the the frosting into his mouth yeah that's going to bring up some interesting elements i think that's gonna you know the the ter the Termites are going to come out of the woodwork of the internet on that one, I'm afraid. Um, Unfortunately. Yeah. I was just going to say, did you just turn Tasmanian Devil into a verb? Oh, good yes, Lord. I, turned, I turned Tasmanian Devil into a verb. I'm that and, we can, and we can talk to Lordly <laughs> Hour later as to whether or not, you know, the Tasmanians would use it as a verb. Um, but I would... <laughs> no, I think they would. Uh, well, unless you've actually... Unless you've actually seen the show Tasmania, Tasmanian Devil in his normal appearances would probably only just sound like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, Pretty much. I think that all of us would be remiss if we didn't at least mention the remastered introduction. Um, remastered, yes. yes. However, I, I must admit, that. I was disappointed because there was a lot of hype that the extended intro was going to be played for episode three. I'm just going to have to look forward to episode four in this case, because I'm, I'm sure that if they didn't do it for season three, they're going to have to do it for season or for, or for episode three. They're going to have to do it for episode four, right? Well, bear so, in mind that the more intro there is, the less show there is, you know, I mean, so if the intro is 30 seconds, you know, longer, that just means that the show is going to be that much sweeter. It's just going to be that much more potent. It's going to be condensed. <laughs> it's going to be 30 seconds second sweeter um I, one thing i noticed <clears throat> when i saw the episode for the first time on saturday was that they had remastered the vocals and so you actually get to hear the the singer a lot clearer but in terms of animation the only difference i noticed was the train you know and i think there were some minor differences that there people was noticed. A, a couple minor differences one of the other things is in the original uh, opening animatics sequence um there was the stallion unshorn fetlocked big macintosh bodied caramel and um, they removed him from the opening animatic and replaced him with Big Mac. However, there was a bit of a funny thing because the beginning of the episode opens up and rather than normal caramel in the background, as we're seeing them go through town, uh, we actually see one of the background ponies walking around is the stallion Big Mac bodied, unshorn fetlocked version of caramel, cutie mark and all. I just want to bring up, I know this is probably going to sound like a rant about my favorite pony, but I thought he was fantastic in this episode. Oh god, okay? how could I have forgotten Rarity? How could you forget about Rarity? Suddenly the couch. couch out of nowhere. Suddenly couch out of nowhere, okay? She was just great. Her expressions, her everything, her voice, everything was just so expressive. We can't forget Rainbow Dash. If we're going to bring up Rain Rainbow Glasses. Rainbow Glasses. And, and we, know, we know it wasn't we know it couldn't have possibly been a reference because this stuff was starting. They had already started and finished quite a, a couple of these episodes uh, before 
before they'd even heard of bronies as far as season two goes i would say that this is another example of great minds thinking alike though because it's a case of beautiful timing she just looks that awesome in sunglasses i think though if we didn't mention the uh now I, and i should say i'm not sure if there's a term for this yet but the sonic nuclear explosion that she did oh god tactical rain nuke or something sonic rain boom into into intercontinental intercontinental ballistic dash yep. my friend it is i've seen tactical rain bomb is it a rain bomb it's the sonic the sonic rain bomb that think, sounds that yeah. sounds great who came up with that term was that you autumn i think um our website editor Sockware came up with the uh, tactical rain nuke or tactical rain bomb, and then I came up with tactical rain nuke. I like rain bomb because it sounds like rain boom. I thought of Sonic rain bomb. So fandom, fandom, listen up, listen up. Whether you go with rain nuke or rain bomb, you heard it first on Everfree Radio. <laughs> 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 Tune in next week when we kind Mortar. Spitfire does indeed of the Sonic Rainbow. Okay, so that being said, I think we've outlined most of the. Uh, I've out- I think we've outlined most of the positives of the episode. Actually, one thing I want to put bring up as well, another positive, is what I enjoyed was the fact that Twilight always had a reminder of how much time she had left. You know, with the with the windmill yes. constantly ticking like a clock along with the sun and even that was really in well done the smallest even in the smallest aspect of scootaloo making the cuckoo noises is still a clock. yep i actually well first of all it proves again that scootaloo may very well be some form of avian Chicken. creature i won't name names um <laughs> but uh it's highly debated, so let's not pick sides here, or else we're going <laughs> to get bombarded. But I think I think that the visual cues were all great. I think that uh, you know, especially using the windmill as almost like a, a second hand, and then having the the sun click into position. I mean, that really is is a great example of how the show is just so masterfully uh what is it planned out storyboarded and animated i mean the little details like that are what really make the show you know stand out as a superior show though i have to say there's one last thing that we still haven't quite addressed yet and i know that moonlight would kill us all if we didn't mention fluttershy oh yes fluttershy and the bear Fluttershy and the bear, who I have uh, affectionately coined Harry the bear, <laughs> because because of that imaginary bear. But uh, but yeah, you know he lives in that cave. They were supposed to house he it for him. He finally came but, back um, from vacation at the <laughs> beach. Uh, but apparently he'd gotten himself a little. Uh, he gotten himself a little uh, too too uh, tense at the beach, and so he decided surfing, to, go to you know? go to Fluttershy for a massage. But the way in which they show us this massage was ridiculous we come into the forest expecting fluttershy to be caring for animals but no it looks like she is fighting a bear it looks like she kills him it looks like she is fighting a bear and winning and then she cracks the bear's neck like it looks like that it looks like she has straight up broken this bear's neck and twilight's just like (gasps) and she's like i'll come back later this is what makes this show that much more awesome is that you can have that moment i think i came in at an awkward time where the yeah where the pony can appear to kill a bear i mean that just sums it up right there (laughs) i honestly i honestly don't think i'd ever ask fluttershy to be my masseuse well she's that good though it was an aggress it was a really aggressive massage, which makes me think that perhaps Fluttershy wasn't just doing it for the bear. Maybe she's attempting to do something new to try and get out all of that 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 pent up anger and, and and fury that we've seen in certain episodes like like uh oh, the, the oh. best night ever. Hey fanfic writers. Guess what? Now you have new subjects. What makes Fluttershy so angry? Get writing. That being said, however, this was this was a very uh, this was a very elements of harmony light episode. Its focus was quite a bit on Twilight. There was a few interesting little tidbits here and there with with uh, what the sonic rain bomb uh, for uh, taking care of Applejack's uh, broken down shed and Fluttershy wrestling the bear and Rarity being so so very melodramatic <laughs> and Pinkie Pie being. Actually, Pinkie Pie was Pinkie Pie was just pretty much Pinkie Pie, but she was she was actually only present for like the picnic and the 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 last scene when she was a uh, when they were talking to Princess Celestia. So Pinkie Pie was very very not in this episode. 
I will say, I guess the storyboarders weren't feeling very pinky keen <laughs> that day. Oh, uh, God, that's a terrible pun. <laughs> um, I did I did have to say I was very happy to hear her springing around in this episode, you know, boing, boing, boing again. That was nice. Oh, yes. Uh, very nice. Um, that being said... All of this uh, wrapped up. Uh, how would you how would you grade the episode? In all honesty, I I couldn't really I couldn't really pick this episode apart and find much bad about it because I've known people who are like this. <laughs> I mean, I've 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 had an aunt. I, I have an aunt who is that bad when it comes to her OCD that she she will invent things to to do to 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 fix a problem if she perceives a problem that isn't really a problem well um the, the question we have to ask if we're going to rate this is what is our rating scale going to be are we going to do this out of cupcakes are we going to do this on in terms I, of I think we should do it in this in, in the generic in the generic sense I, I think we should keep it to like the stars since that's the that's kind of like what equestria daily and so, some of the other places so like and a five fan star. fictions and stuff like a five star rating and if you can't say and if you don't think that five star covers enough ground give it like a one out of ten so uh, in all honesty okay. in all honesty this episode for me it had all it had all of the good and pretty much none of the bad and even with even with the the light presence of the supporting cast, the other elements of harmony and stuff like that. I felt that this was a very, very strong episode. We got a whole lot more depth into just how Twilight thinks and how her how her process works in her brain. In all honesty, this episode, in, in my opinion, is one of those episodes that from a perspective, it, it's from my perspective, it, it works perfectly. And I would honestly give it a, just a straight up five. It's so enjoyable to watch. It's got a great conflict in there. It's got great character development for, for Twilight. And it's got all of these, these, these small elements, these references that, that the fans themselves are going to enjoy so much, especially the stuff like rainbow glasses, uh, you've got you got you got uh, Trollestia returning. You know you've got all of this crazy stuff going on. I think it's a perfect episode. Yeah, that's um, one of the things you brought up is we haven't really gotten to see um, Twilight's academic side more really because we see her studying in the first episode of season one about Nightmare Moon and everything, and then the occasional reference to hitting the books as she puts it, but. Uh, most of the time when we see her referencing a book or whatever, she can pull it out in, like, I, I regret that I'm going to say this 10 seconds Ugh. flat, but <laughs> but um, we see how she's like, if she can't get something done. So, Crescendo, what would your rating be out of five stars? What would you rate this episode? I would give it five Twilight Sparkles. Nice, definitely. nice. Now, the real question is, is because uh, I forgot one thing that I was going to mention, is is one of the reasons this episode works so well for me, in my opinion, is it delves so far into into Twilight's mindset and, and, and like the way she works is, are we going to get more of the same for the rest of the supporting cast? Are we going to get a day? I've been definitely been looking forward to that. A full day in the life of Applejack, a full day in the life of Pinkie Pie, a full day in the life of Rainbow Dash. I don't think we should expect any less from the studio. I think it'll happen. I should think so. I think if this episode is any kind of indication, um, it's clear that the writers are willing to go into <clears throat> a very large swath of the characters' backgrounds, even into darker areas like what we saw with twilight this time so i think that you know this <laughs> this has definitely whetted my appetite for the rest of the season that's for sure and i can say as a big wuna fan that i'm very much very much looking forward to next week after seeing this episode well give me a big bro buff over here because i'm a huge wuna fan all right so so since only i and crescendo have given uh, our ratings let's let's hear your guys's ratings real quick uh, draft and autumn well, from an artist's perspective, I was looking at a lot of the small details that they put as well. And um, there were a lot of little things that they added that I thought were just really charming. Um, when Rainbow Dash took off at one point, there was a little puff of rainbow smoke. I thought that was adorable. I liked when they uh, held her, when, when Twilight stopped her midair, and you could see like part of her tail was, was still in flying yes. mode, and then she was hanging. It was fantastic. <laughs> also, We forgot to mention... Twilight Sparkle, the psychologist. Oh God! <laughs> complete with complete with glasses. Her glasses and her bun. They were. Yeah, I did notice as well, um, and I'm sure you noticed this too, Autumn. That uh, 
that now when Twilight is using her magic, it has its own aura color. It does, and Rarity, uh, every all the unicorns, I'm sure now have their own now it's not just going to be generic we'll see that it's going to give them some unique um their own little unique uh style it personalizes the magic is what you're trying to say it personalizes the friendship yeah it personalizes the magic it personalizes them yes it personalizes the friendship so on a scale of one to five Christian, or not Christian, and I have already given uh, ours, uh, Draft, Autumn. On a scale of one to five, I would give it a five just because even even the um, side characters got incredible characterization. I mean, Rarity was fantastic. Rainbow Dash was fantastic in her, in her parts. Fluttershy was hardly even shown, and she did a great job. So I would give it a five for great writing and just really, really great animation and storyboarding. Well, if I was going to do my my quick sum up and rating of this episode, I would have to say that, you know, when I look at an episode um, and there have been episodes that haven't met all these kinds of criteria, I kind of am watching to see, you know, first of all, it's got to be funny. It's got to be really well animated. You know, it's got to have good characterization and it's got to be, in a sense, unexpected. It can't be cliche. I think that this episode really, yeah, it, it came out of left field for me I, you know I, I said it earlier in, in this segment that when i read the synopsis i thought this was going to be a bottle episode i thought it was going to be something very simple twilight having some kind of moral conundrum and then you know it is resolved la di da di da they took it so much further and the, in, the idea that the show could you know the producers and the animators and the storyboarders and the actors could take a, a story that really in any other show would have been boring and make it this interesting with that level of individual detail. I mean, I have to give it a five because I laughed all the way through it. Um, like we've been saying, the uh, the characterization was just astounding. Um, and and it, yeah, the details, the little things like the sonic rain bomb, the uh, <laughs> you know the the moment where where Twilight becomes Smeagol, you know, all that. So I was uh, I was basically very much impressed by the episode overall all right so um autumn go ahead and finish your thought um well i was just going to say that if this is any indicator of how they're going to show the characterization in other episodes i think that we're in for a big treat this season we're going to see a lot more depth in the characters and they already showed a lot of it in a lot of the um other episodes in the first season this one's going to go even deeper i think we might even see some history for each pony, which could be very fun. I agree. I think it'll be. I think it'll be very fun. Um, well, that being said, I think that we've pretty much. Uh, we, I think we've gone over time for for the first segment. So stay tuned to this, and we will go ahead. And after the audio break, you'll be able to hear our next segment. All right. Well, next up, we have an exclusive interview with renowned brony musician Sketchy Sounds. But before that, let's take a listen to At the Gala, the 20% Cooler remix by Sim Gratina. So we'll see you in five minutes.
Eagles, they will need fair rarity. They will see on Justice Regal at the gala. I will find him, my Prince Charming, and I gallant he will be. He will treat me like a lady tonight. This is Final Draft, and I'm here with Crescendo and Sketchy Sounds. Hello. Hey there. Sketchy, Hello. Uh, thanks for being with us today um, on our premiere episode of Everfree Radio. And so yeah, just it's a pleasure. To get, just to get started, uh, I wanted to ask you a basic question that everyone needs to ask of any member of the community. How did you go, Brony? Ah, well, that's an interesting story. Um... I am a forum administrator over at a Sonic forum known as the Emobius Forum. Um, and basically what happened with me was uh, I noticed that um, ponies started creeping in here and there. Primarily in our spam forum, I noticed a lot of pony stuff popping up. So I was like, well, what the heck is this all about? So I decided to go check it out, um, find out what all the fuss was about. And inevitably I found like the first couple of episodes on YouTube had a watch of them and was like, this is actually pretty good. And that like that was like just the pilot. I thought this is pretty good. And then I watched the stuff that come, came after that and was like, this is actually pretty spectacular. 
Um, and that was fairly early on in the life of the show because it was like, um, I think it was maybe October or November that I started that I started doing that because when I'd gotten into it, the season hadn't finished yet. There were still new episodes coming out. So, but yeah, well, that's basically it in a nutshell. So when you first encountered the show, um, and I should clarify for the audience that, that you are known online um, as Sketchy Sounds, the musician. When you first yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, when you first started, you know, watching the show, did you immediately think, "Aha, this is something I could play"? Interestingly enough, no, uh, not initially. Um, it wasn't until I started. It wasn't until later on in the series when there were, like, major musical numbers coming up. I mean, the prime example would be Winter Wrap-Up. When I first heard that, and specifically when I started um, hearing that song, and I noticed the um, acoustic guitar in, like, the intro and also in the reprise, it was like, hey, actually, that's that sounds really good. And it's also fairly simplistic, yet it sounds really great. And I thought to myself, I could probably play that. And then a little later on, there was a project where... Um, <clears throat> There was a community-based, well, there was a community, crea- community created, I should say, uh, chord book was released for guitarists, and I picked that up and I was like, I can have some fun with this. And we'll try to have um, a link to that in the uh, comments down below. <laughs> so, um, was Winter Wrap Up the first song you played from My Little Pony then? Yes, yes it was. Um, I mean, it's, it's a fairly simplistic tune. Um, it was the first one I picked up, and I was like... This is just like maybe four or five chords here, um, and it was like it's a fairly simple progression. And also, I really, really love the song. It, it, you know, as you're probably aware, a lot of the music from the series is a real earworm. It just sticks. You know, it, it worms its way into your ears and just like kind of sticks there and stays there. And it like you get it stuck in your head for days, and you find yourself singing it and humming it, and you're like, my goodness, what has happened? I'm having I images could... from Wrath of Khan in my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> I could oh, not I remember that stop. Film. I could not stop listening to Winter Wrap Up after I first heard that episode. Yeah, same here, pretty much. So that was what started it, really. I think was that one. Well, for our uh, our listeners who are outside the UK, I think they may have recognized a distinctive Scottish accent there. Um, <laughs> I, I I assume you live in Scotland. I do indeed. Uh, are you, where in Scotland are you? I am located in the city of Dundee. That's in the southeast. Um, it's on the eastern coast of Britain. Um, and it's interestingly, a little bit of uh, trivia for you here. As far as I'm aware, it is the only southern facing city in Scotland. Well, and I was going to ask you. Um... Do you, in Dundee, is there a brony community locally that you interact with at all, or...? Mm, I, I know that there are other bronies in Dundee, because, I mean, this is the thing, one of my other interests is um, cosplay. I'm part of the Scottish Cosplayers Group, one of the administrators for it, in fact. Um, although I'm not very active with it currently, due to other commitments. But um, I know there are fans of the ponies within that, um, and some of them are based in Dundee. As for how big the brony community in this particular city is, though, I wouldn't be able to say off the top of my head, although I know they're out there. Um, I have actually been considering talking to other folks and maybe organising something at some point. Do you think that being in Scotland and being in Dundee has had a a direct influence on your interpretation of the Pony songs? Um, To some extent, perhaps. Um, But, I mean, that would also be my own taste in music that has had an influence on how I do things as well. I mean, my tastes go very much towards, like, older stuff and, like, uh, traditional folk music and so forth, yet still with some, um, like, classic rock and stuff mixed in. It was the sort of things I like. So I would say that has certainly had an influence. In terms of the sound, certainly where I live and so forth has had an influence because of, simply because of the way I speak and so forth and the way I sing. That's unavoidable. <laughs> so that brings me to the point, what originally inspired you to play music? Oh, that would be, without a doubt, that would have been my dad. When I was quite young, say no more than about five or six years old, um, was actually when I first started playing guitar. See, the thing was, when I was growing up, um, my dad was 
my dad has a guitar and he would be playing all the time. He would play songs for me and my brothers and so forth. Um, so, yeah, certainly he would have been a massive influence in it. He would be playing the guitar quite a bit and also both my mum and my dad liked listening to records and tapes and so forth. So there's always been music in my household. Um, not having it there just feels wrong, you know? So it's that that's influenced me to be, you know, to play music and so forth. Well, so <clears throat> where did the screen name Sketchy Sounds come about? Because you you certainly use it all over the interwebs, and um, you're notorious in uh, in the uh, Equestria Daily IRC with it. Um, where did you get that? That one's quite simple. Um, basically, a little while after um, start, well, a little while after I discovered Equestria Daily, and then specifically after discovering the chat and so forth. Um, I decided, right, I need to find, well, this is one of the things I tend to do with any um, fan community of, like, animation or games or whatever that I get into, or, well, mostly with animation and so forth and shows and so on, and game communities as well, I usually tend to think to myself, you know, I should make myself some sort of avatar to fit in here. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people do that. Well, I know a lot of people do that, so... Well, indeed they do. <laughs> yeah. Initially, um, in IRC, in IRC, I was actually using the name of a different pony character that I came up with, probably one of my first, in fact, um, which was Salad Sandwich. But uh, I thought to myself, you know, I can't keep using this nick, because for one thing, it belongs to a character I've made, and for another, it's feminine, and I'm not a girl, and I don't want people to think I'm a girl and, you know, make, this, make the wrong sort of assumptions and so forth, so I thought... <clears throat> I need to make myself um, a masculine character and name and so forth. So, um, Sketchy Sounds is quite simply the name of the online avatar presence I came up with, which and the the name came about because of the two main talents that well, two main areas of talent that I wanted the name to represent. Sketchy part of it comes from the fact that I'm fairly handy with a pencil or a pen because I, I write, I draw and stuff. And then the sounds part is obvious, that's the skill with music and so on. Well, and we were going to go get into that. Um, you are an artist as well. Indeed I am. A man of many talents. Quite so. A renaissance brony, as it were. Do you, <laughs> do you find that uh, your art and your music influence each other to some extent? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes, certainly my music will often influence, well, I say my music, um, I should say my taste in music, quite often I will find myself influenced by what I'm listening to as to what I will draw. I mean, like for example, say I was drawing something, I wanted to draw a picture that was like fairly, I don't know, if it was fairly melancholy, for example, then I would find myself something maybe slow and sad sounding or something like that in order to get myself into the mood for drawing that. Whereas, of course, if I was, like, if I was drawing some sort of epic battle scene, I'd want something fast-paced and upbeat and, you know, something to get the uh, pulse going. Um, so certainly music does influence art in, in that respect. As the other way around, not so much. Um, I am more of a performer of music rather than a composer. I do do the odd bit of composition, but um, I don't th I don't find, or haven't found yet anyway, that music has been influenced so much by art. Although, certainly I dare say it could happen. Well, and you also, I've heard a rumor, have been working on a rather large fan fiction, haven't you? <laughs> yes, indeed I have. And ha how is that coming along? And will we be seeing it soon? <clears throat> Ooh, uh, tough questions. Well, as far as coming along goes, the last time I did a word count on it, it was... Uh, I was just around fifteen or 16,000 words it has gotten up to. Wow. It's consisting of, let me see, I think that's up to a fourth chapter now. Um, the structure of it, it has a prologue, an intermission, and then the first chapter, and then another, another intermission, then the next chapter. It, it basically has intermissions between each chapter, and those are like a sort of little introspective look into some part of the story, but it wouldn't necessarily be clear what part. Um, it's just kind of like a quick glimpse of something, and then back into the story um, is how I'm doing it. But yeah, that's up to about 
I think it's the fourth chapter that I'm working on now, and it's over 16,000 words. It's going to end up being very, very long, I know that much. It could even outdo the last very long bit of writing I did. As, as for how soon it will be seen, um, I couldn't give a direct answer on that. Um, <laughs> but I would say keep your eyes peeled. I think I will probably um, submit some of it to Equestria Daily fairly soon because I I want to make sure I've built up enough of a buffer first to keep up a pace for updating if I can. Which is always nice, <clears throat> I can say, as a reader yes. of fanfic. It's always very nice. Yeah, I, I don't like to keep people hanging if I can avoid it. Well, it certainly sounds interesting. And um, if memory serves correctly, we have planned to do an actual reading of it, haven't we? We have indeed. Um, I mean, yes, myself and yourself and one or two other folk that we know we're planning, are certainly planning to do some reading of it at some point, which should be rather good fun, I think. Um, uh, I mean, I am intending to, well, it's not going to be me that will narrate it, rather that was going to be Mason, as I recall. Um, I will simply be voicing my own character that's in there. Um, and yeah, we have other people lined up for voicing other parts, although we shouldn't go giving away too much about that yet. Of course. J just enough to give a little uh, little teaser. Indeed, to whet the appetites of those listening. Of course. <clears throat> and also we shall be providing links to um, Sketchy's Divine Art, if um, that's where you are, Deviant isn't it? Deviant Art. Deviant yes. Art, it's pronounced here. <laughs> oh, hush. <laughs> yes, I I am I do have a Deviant Art account, um, and of course I also have my stream, which I do every so often. I was going to ask, um, you work <clears throat> in writing, you work in music, and you work in art. Have you ever considered doing a project that combines all three elements? Something that, you know, that has artwork and music and fan fiction all as one larger compendium, as it were? Um, I've thought about it on occasion. Um, I'm starting to think, though, possibly I might be able to actually do that with... Um, Maybe later on down the line with the fic that I'm currently writing, it could be entirely possible to do something that would combine all three. I mean, if you think about it, I can easily... Well, I've already um, said that I would like to draw some, do some illustrations for certain parts of the story. I could easily incorporate them in there. And if I could find some way of then also having, like, for example, the particular recording of narration and voices that I'm wanting to have done added in there too, that would be easy enough. And music could then also be added as well here and there. There are parts of the story that do have um, music involved. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I know that you're working on the fic part of it uh, a little bit with Octavia from the, the IRC. Have you ever done any um, some any work uh, with other musicians? Um, on occasion, yes. Um. One thing that certainly comes to mind was there was a friend of mine from the States who was working on a uh, arrangement stroke remix of um, a song or two from some Sonic games. Wanted my feedback and I helped him out with that. And I've also helped him out with some other stuff as well. Um, arranging drum tracks and putting voices on stuff and so forth. So yeah, I have collaborated with other musicians before. Have you ever considered, say, going to a brony convention and, say, doing a, a live show with other brony musicians? Would that be something that would appeal to you? Hell yes. <laughs> All right, so brony musicians out there listening, Sketchy Sounds is waiting. <laughs> Indeed I am. The, waiting the, and eager. Well, one minor caveat I must put in there is that, unfortunately, at the moment I'm flat and stony broke, so if you want me to come somewhere, you'll have to get me there. You'll have to transport me there somehow. But if you can do it, I will totally come. I think there are several members of the crew of Everfree Radio <laughs> who would be in the same boat. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Or same so, plane. <laughs> so sketchy, within the R community, the, your main repertoire is pony songs, as evidenced from your stream. But I, I'm sure you've ventured into other musical genres. What would you say would be the most common to catch you in? Ooh, uh, that's that's easy enough. That would be like folk music stroke uh, classic rock. I mean, this is the thing. 
the the two particular songs I learn have been heavily influenced by what I've listened to and also what I'm capable of playing. So, for example, uh, Ralph McTell is one of my main influences in terms of what I will pick out and play. And unfortunately, there are not a lot of people who will know who he is simply by name. But if I were to name his most famous song, the Streets of London, loads of people know that one. They just don't always bother to you learn the name of the uh, particular artist. But I really like his style. I like the way he does, like, sort of folky plucking and so forth. Um, that kind of thing I really love. I like to play that sort of thing myself. Um, but again, also, I am quite fond of um, rock music as well. Um, <laughs> stuff by Queen comes to mind and all that sort of thing. So it's it's basically, my tastes are wide and varied. They influence what I'll play, but I mean, so long as I like the sound of it, as long as it's got a beat, I can listen to it and I can enjoy it. And I'm, if it's relatively easy to pick out, then I would want to play it. I'm quite very much the same way. <laughs> I think so, a lot of musicians are. So we can so, expect a rendition of, uh, of Michael Jackson soon? <laughs> <laughs> it, would have to, it would depend on the track, but you never know. So, since you're well known for your sketchy stream, what would you say your favourite song is and why? That I play on the stream, or...? Yes, that you play. Ooh, that's difficult. That's that's literally like asking me to pick a favourite limb. Um, <clears throat> but certainly, the ones I do enjoy playing... Um, I Now that I can actually do it properly, I can actually do it more justice, I really love playing at the gala. Um, that is definitely a favourite of mine. Also, Winter Wrap-Up. Um, that was the first one I ever started playing. It still holds a special place in my heart. Additionally, I also really like... Um, there's some non-pony stuff I play as well. At the request of Octavia, I went and... Well, actually, I don't know whether... She, no, she did request it. I went and learned The Lighthouse's Tale, which is by Nickel Creek. And I actually really, really love that song myself now as well. There's a few Ralph McTell tracks I play, such as Terminus, for example, and I've played Zero Man Blues once or twice. And I'll also admit, as a guilty pleasure, I absolutely love playing the Sea Pony song. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very oh guilty pleasure. A very it is a guilty, guilty pleasure, pleasure but, indeed. But in my Just, defense, I am a child of the 80s. I grew up with that kind of music, so... <laughs> Just be thankful we're not asking you to play it now. Indeed. Well, so, bro... Um, broadening that point, um, we know you play <coughs> more than one instrument. You Indeed you are known mainly for your guitar, but what other instruments do you play? Well, um, there is a lot in my repertoire. Um, the main things that I play would be the guitar, obviously, and the drums is the other main thing that I really love. I mean, to give you some perspective, I've been playing guitar since I was six, and the drums since I was about... 10, I think, maybe 11. Um, so I've had a lot of years of experience on both, and I absolutely love both instruments. But in addition to that, I also play, um, well, just about anything I can get my hands on. I have, in here in my room, for example, I have keyboard, I have two penny whistles, I've got three ocarinas, um, and a couple of flutes as well of various shapes and sizes. So basically, whatever I can get my hands on, if I can get a sound of it, a sound out of it, and a good sound, then I'll want to play it. The things I would like to pick up next would be uh, the cello and the saxophone, if I can get my hands on them. Would you care to give us an example of, say, two instruments, perhaps ocarina and tin whistle? I reckon I could do that, yes. Uh, which would you like to hear first? Um, the ocarina. Okay. So, since you've got an ocarina, do you, do you think you could send us back to the start of the first day? <laughs> Let's see if we can manage that. Give me a moment. I feel just just enriched with rupees. <laughs> That's funny. I lost all mine. <laughs> well, you should have given them to the uh, the lady in town. <laughs> And, um, I believe you have your... is it a penny whistle? Yes, it is. Well... Would you the... care to give us an example of that? Yeah, give me a moment. Um, I'll need to remember how to play this particular tune, but let's see.
There you go. Dragon Roof Isle from Wind Waker. You've brought back countless memories of spending so long sailing along that damn sea. <laughs> For some reason I have this urge to fire a cannon. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever uh, tried doing a, uh, a rendition of a pony song using one of those instruments or trying to record with it? I have. In fact, actually I've done that on my stream before. Um, I can play Winter Wrap Up on the Ocarina quite easily. Would you be willing to do that for uh, Everfree? <clears throat> sure, give me a moment. Let's see here. And it keeps on going from there, obviously. <laughs> that was brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you. Hands up, all you listeners, if you were singing along. <laughs> I suspect. Do you not mean hooves? <laughs> <laughs> of course. How silly of me. Hands and or hooves, uh, as 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 per needed. And or other appendages. Tentacles and whatnot. Mm, so, um, or faces obviously. If you're a <laughs> Obviously, you don't play these songs like <clears throat> exactly mirrored to the show. What types of like your own flares do you put in them? It depends on the song. Um, I mean, some of them obviously I wouldn't be able to do exactly as they are in the show simply because my voice, excuse me, will not go that high. <laughs> A key example of that would be like pretty much any of Pinky's songs. There is absolutely no way my vocal cords are going to reproduce her kind of sound. So, <clears throat> if I'm singing her songs, I do maybe try to mimic her voice a little, like the sort of tone that she has, but I cannot mimic her her pitch. Um, so what? So what you're telling us is that in effect you are a uh, flutter guy. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I can actually do a fairly good rendition of flutter guy as well. You shouldn't tell that to a, a radio interviewer because we're then going to ask you to do it. Yeah, just give us the I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are uh, often seen on your on your broadcast playing your guitar. So yes, I am. Is there a guitar tune that you could say play for us for the uh, broadcast today? Yes, indeed. Um, I assume you're wanting a pony track. Would that be correct? I think that if we didn't go with a pony track, that uh, that you know the site might be bombarded. People would be up in arms. Well, up in the dress, do you? That will do perfectly. Okay, just give me a moment here. I just need to maneuver and get my guitar into position. Here we go. <laughs> You can hear this okay, I assume? Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Now, as mentioned previously, I tend to put my own flair on things. Um, if I were to play this exactly as it is in the show, I would have to be plucking the strings, and the guitar does not give as rich a sound that way. So, well, as you'll hear, I tend to just strum rather than pluck for this particular song, as I do with most. That's fine. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Dress 
Hip, red by thread, print and press, yard by yard, never stress. That's the art of the dress. Now, the stars on my belt need to be technically accurate. Orion has three stars on his belt, not four. down here. This is a thing that happens in my stream. Um, because of the limitations of technology, I have to have like all the pages of lyrics and or a song in one place, and sometimes I have to pause and scroll down to him. That's what happens on my stream, it's what's happened here. I'll just resume from where I was. <clears throat> to be about 20% cooler. Are we ever one is in this city? Are we really like is what we know? Got that style with it here. It's actually we make it good and here it's even if it's simply not to fuck it. Because it stays within our budget. That's what we're coming to today. Remember it's all the presentation. Piece by piece, snip by snip, group dog can't shoulders hip. Bolt by bolt, print and press, yard by yard, always stress, and that's the art of the dress. Thank you. <laughs> well that done, was well fantastic. Done. Thank you very much. Well, and I have to say that a. Uh, a break in the song there actually added a bit of authenticity because listeners, you got to hear what a sketchy sounds uh, broadcast actually sounds like. <laughs> and sadly with that, it looks like we're going to have to winter wrap up this interview. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, Sketchy. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you again. Um, Sketchy Sounds has a broadcast again that is, will be linked below. Um, he can also be found on Deviant Art under Silver Shadow, and is 
a common uh, a common appear in uh, the IRC chat on Equestria Daily. Just be careful what you say to him. He is a mod. Yep. <laughs> Step out the line and you get sent to the moon. <laughs> oh my, it's happened to me too many times. Alright, thanks again. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again to Sketchy Sounds and Alyssa. In the next segment, Bones and Moonlight review the fanfic Get Along Home. But first, some music. Bust out your dictionaries and enjoy Crepuscular Itty, also known as Twilight Sparkles theme by Acoustic Brony. Now to the Everfree Radio Fan Thick Review Corner with Bones and Moonlight. Gentlemen, take it away. Hi there, I'm Brush and Bones. And I'm Moonlight. And this is our Fan Thick Review Corner, where we take stories that the fandom has produced and go ahead and with an in-depth analysis of them. Our story for this week is going to be Get Along Home by No Space, a story that revolves around popular fan and character Derpy Hooves. Also known as Ditsy Do, among some people. Now, in this story... Derpy, uh, actually, perhaps we should give you a little bit of backstory first. Derpy is a character who is literally a gimmick, uh, created by one of the animators after they had given her what is referred to in the fandom as Derp Eyes for a single shot in one of the earlier episodes, and she became so wildly popular that they decided to add her in to little small background segments throughout season one. So popular character that supposedly she's actually getting more characterization in upcoming season two. The fandom refers to characterize her as a bit of a klutz, a little not there in the head, and as a male person for some reason. 
Yes, it's become a big fan in concept that she's uh, a male mayor delivering letters to and from the people of Ponyville. Another character that is closely tied to Ditsy Doo slash Derby Hooves is the character of Dinky Doo or Dinky Hooves, who is a unicorn with these with a similar color scheme, hairstyle, and eye color to Derpy herself. Uh, this small unicorn filly that the Fanon has taken to consider her as Derpy's child. Dinky first appeared in the background of, I believe, the musical number of Winter Wrap-Up, where she appeared with Derpy's color scheme as well as her cutie mark, which is probably why she's associated with the character. And the character herself, uh, Dinky in this regard, has had a little bit of shifts in color scheme throughout her appearances in the background, but for the most part, she remains relatively similar to Derpy in appearance, and thus has been treated as her child. Now, all of these concepts are taken into account in Get Along Home to produce a background as thus. Derpy Hooves is a single mother male mare who has her eye issues, where her eyes will go derpy, as the fan fandom uh, refers to it as. But in addition to this, um, as is common in the fandom, they usually don't just settle for her having a, a set of lazy eyes. They usually give her some further uh, handicap, whether it ranges from full-on autism to something a lot more minor. In this case, the story settles on an aphasia, particularly one that seems to be a kind of com combination of dysnomia and cluttering, which is where people will use synonyms in places of words that they can't remember, or will use words that sound like they have a similar meaning, but aren't exactly appropriate in the context of the sentence. Malapropisms, if you will. The story also focuses on Derpy's love life. Uh, it is indeed a ship fic. It is indeed a ship fic. Um, ironically enough, one of the few ship fics that, uh, in my opinion, works really well, mostly on account of the fact that they really attempt to do their utmost to just stick to characters that are background ponies. Um, in this case, the ship fic is very clearly clearly labeled as uh, Derpy, Derpy Mac, so it's Derpy Hooves and Big Macintosh, and I felt that they they went uh, they went well with this this particular ship because the way in which they've characterized both characters. Uh, comes off as very suitable and is pr done pretty well as far as the characterization goes. Despite them being only background ponies with little to no characterization in the show itself. Exactly. Now, uh, the story itself starts off, basically, with Derpy herself being a male mare and single mother. She is living with roommate Carrot Top, another background pony that has had several appearances in the show. And several hair colors in the show also <laughs> but um with her roommate carrot top she takes care of her daughter dinky sends her to school and does her job as well as can can be done and carrot top is giving her flack for not talking to the stallion that she has a crush on namely big mac that all changes when derpy or ditsy do as she prefers to be called in this fic uh, runs into Big Mac by accident at the grocery store, uh, embarrassing herself quite, um, embarrassing herself quite profusely and running off, uh, eliciting a response from Big Mac to, uh, track her down and issue an apology. It's, it's quite a meet-cute situation where they have that cute little crash into each other moment of embarrassment, but it's, it's played very well in this regard where because of her aphasia, Derpy can't ac accurately communicate what she what she means to Big Macintosh, and so he thinks that he thinks that he was rude or perhaps even insulting to her. Well, when she goes back home, she's informed by Carrot Top that Carrot Top ran into Big Mac that day and has arranged for the two of them to meet up so that they can discuss what happened at length and deliver their respective apologies. Of course, Derpy is not exactly sure she wants to go through with it because she's very, very embarrassed and is very, uh, not necessarily self-loathing in this regard, but she's very aware of her own condition and knows that other other ponies 
treat her differently because of it. One of the uh, one of the biggest things in this story is the fact that she knows she's different, and she's also acknowledged as being different. Um, her actual name, as she's referred to in this story, is Ditsy Doo, but Derpy is the derogatory nickname that most ponies in town use for her. The only one who's who does it with any form of uh niceness or kindness just as a friendly sort of nick nickname is carrot top herself you know i don't understand that if i had a rather derogatory nickname i wouldn't even let my friends use it even if it was used in a kind way well and i think one of the biggest reasons that it's done that way is mostly just to show when carrot top is expressing frustration at at Ditsy's actions, uh, particularly when she's getting angry at Ditsy for continuing to avoid Big Macintosh, uh, and then Ditsy starts to go off on herself about how Big Macintosh is is a good stallion and a mare like herself with all these issues isn't isn't really worthy for him. When Carrot Top decides to basically start to get serious and and nag her for her continuous self-deprecating behavior and refers to her as derpy and calls her stupid you know this is starting to remind me of a bad romantic comedy it is kind of like bad romantic comedy uh in, in a sense bad romantic comedy or or um or anime or even chick flicks why do i like this thick again you like it because of how outrageously adorable it is Oh yes, that's that's right. Because for all of the flaws that can be found in this story and its delivery or anything like that, it's really one of those things that's a kind of uh it's like um it's like a certain number of chick flicks for um for females out there. Like I just recently watched a review of infamous chick flick Kate and Leopold, which is literally one of the stupidest movies you could ever possibly watch. I've never heard of that. But Hugh Jackman is such a guilty pleasure for men and women alike All right. that it is Oh, you've never heard of it? Well, take it take a chance to watch it sometime and you'll 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 understand what I'm getting at. But um in the long run, this is really it all comes down to her finally getting a chance to meet Big Mac and express herself slowly with a with with an opportunity for both of them to apologize for their respective uh, accidental slip ups and uh derpy decides to write out a letter so that she can better express her words which prompts big mac because her letter basically says she has a crush on him uh, which prompts big mac to agree to uh set up a date for the two of them the date is ridiculously adorable as is the precursor to said date with carrot top getting ditzy ready for her big night and all dressed up and and all that stuff and in a moment of clarity inspired by the artwork that goes with the story uh ditzy is just so cute when she's asking but what if he doesn't like me and of course he's gonna like Ditsy. It's it's inevitable. You can't not like Ditsy. So You can't. Just look at her. Oh no, I mean and that's one of the biggest things that drew me to the story was it had this excellent piece of piece of artwork to associate with it, which was Carrot Top and Ditsy all dressed up and looking absolutely miserable and so nervous, asking, What if he doesn't like me? Carrot Top is just there reassuring. Saying he'll like you. And so Predictably enough, the date the date's a little bit awkward at first, but it goes very well because Big Mac is an understanding and kind-hearted stallion, and Ditsy knows how to. And Ditsy isn't unintelligent; she just has problems expressing herself. So he allows her all the time she needs to express herself in the way that she needs to be expressed. And then you know they they enjoy their date when they go back home. Big Mac discovers that she has a a daughter, which is actually an interesting little twist to throw in at the end there, because you're kind of sitting there going through with, oh, well, what's Big Mac going to think about Dinky? And they 
They call that out at the end of the story. He meets Dinky. We get a little bit of backstory, which of course is Fanon, since both these characters are background characters with no canonical background so far. Yep. And get a little bit of background, and nicely enough, uh, it ends on a cute little note with with uh, a kiss between Ditsy and Big Mac, and earlier, of course, Dinky calling Big Mac out on talking funny on account of his accent, which is a little... A nice little touch there. Hmm, speaking of that accent, I quite like how the author wrote it out in this fic. I really got a feel for how Big Mac speaks. It's like he was there speaking to the reader. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, when it comes to Big Mac himself, I noticed that, uh, that there was a lot of uh, focus in the comments section for the story about how he that the author no space might have overemphasized big mac's accent but i don't really think that it would feel that it was overemphasized much at all and even if it was it was so slight it was still very believable as far as as the accents go uh, i don't know my my cousins are farmers and they have that exact same accent <laughs> It's it's not really overemphasized that much. Well, and now that we've basically gone through the story, we're going to take the next few minutes here to just kind of break it down. From a literary perspective, I think that they've done a very good job building up this background for someone that has literally so so little in the way of actual character in pertaining to the show. They gave her a daughter. They even went in into a little bit of depth with um with explaining where Dinky came from when Big Mac asks uh asks Derpy about it. Uh as far as the character goes, um this is probably one of my favorite interpretations of Ditsy Do slash Derpy Hooves, in that um they didn't take they didn't take her condition to any kind of extreme because there are a lot of people who see the Derp eyes and automatically think, well, this character must be handicapped. Especially in conjunction uh. with the klutzy behavior that was witnessed in Feeling Pinky Keen, where she drops not only a potted plant, but also an anvil and a piano on Twilight Sparkle. Among other things. Among other things, which uh, I can see where people might think that sort of level of klutzy behavior is a bit extreme, but they were going for a Looney Tunes-esque feel for that episode, and the mare that dropped those items was not originally supposed to be Derpy anyways. It was literally a last-minute addition after her popularity spike. Oh, how the fandom influences this show and race. But, uh, as far as the interpretation goes, I felt that, uh... The the lazy eyes plus the aphasia was an actual nice touch because I felt that the aphasia was a disability that did that that wasn't too extreme but also presented a kind of uh, another kind of level to the character because you get this feeling that she's a character that's ostracized by the community and she can't accurately express that she isn't dumb but. She's also this character that, because she has to try so hard to think about what she's going to say in order to produce understandable words and sentences uh, to some degree, you get the feeling that she's she is actually quite intelligent. And her only issue is the execution of her speech. I don't know. As much as I have to agree with you on that, I am getting somewhat tired of how Ditsy Doo is portrayed by the fandom. When it comes to certain extremist point of views, I can certainly uh, get get on the bandwagon there. Like, I, I'm not... As someone with mentally handicapped relatives, I have... There's nothing wrong with portraying a mentally handicapped person and having a, a mentally handicapped character. But one of the things that I don't like about the way the fandom tries to do it is they try to play it up for laughs. Yeah. You know, this, this stupid mentally ill or mentally handicapped person who keeps on goofing stuff up or who can only talk about muffins. You know? Well, the muffins are delicious. They are delicious, indeed. Well, I like muffins. But still, I'd love to see a fic, or at least one fic, as a matter of if it's good or bad, that plays Ditsy as just a person with a lazy eye. That would be nice. And That would be nice. What, one of the moment I see that, I'm reviewing it. Indeed. On the spot. Yeah, right mo there. most definitely. Um, back, to the, back to the literary stuff, though. 
uh, one of the other things is I felt that the pacing was very good. It is a one shot. You don't have to deal with multiple chapters and it's got just enough length to really keep you to keep you going through it. It's paced very well with with how the events take place and the the speed at which events happen. So what ends up happening is basically you've got this story that in the end, in all honesty, while the pacing was good, the worst thing about it from that perspective would probably just be the ending, because the ending is some something of a it's it's really a sudden the the ending is a bit fast. It's it's rather fast. You can tell that the author was trying to wrap it up really quickly. And in all honesty, it left me wanting more. So that might be from either a uh, just the fact that I felt the ending was too fast, perhaps it needed to be a little bit longer to make make it feel like more of a one shot or perhaps it just turned out, you know, maybe maybe the writing was just good enough that I feel that uh I would like to see more of it. In all honesty, I have actually said that um, if the author were to take this further than just the one shot, I would definitely read more. Oh, yes, definitely. And I think that that is definitely a plus on the writing side is it's good enough that you if more were to come out, you would definitely feel like reading more. You want to see what happens, you know, where 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 Big Mac's and Derpy's relationship will go where how Dinky will take to her mother having a uh, a boyfriend and the the effects that that would have on on a child. In addition to this, I'd have to say that the weakest character in this story was probably Carrot Top. Carrot Top. Because she was quite literally she was pretty much and considering she's a background pony, there wasn't much that could really be done there, but she was pretty much that cookie cutter romance comedy chick flick friend. She's that she's that friend that is the the person who's pushing. Their sole reason for being there is to ensure that the plot moves along, pretty much. Indeed. If if this author were to write more about in this little setting the thing I'd like to see the most is a bit more fleshing out of Carrot Top's personality and character. Indeed. And and maybe a bit of Big Mac because yes, who doesn't like who doesn't like Big yes. Mac? Yes. Um, I thought it was a nice touch also that they had um, they they had some cameos by uh other main six characters, specifically Applejack, considering uh Big Mac is involved in the story. Uh, didn't seem to didn't seem to do too bad with what little what little presence Applejack had in the fic, but I say that this is a very good fic. It's got only a few flaws that I can really uh, that I can really point out, and on the whole, it's the kind of fiction that leaves me feeling like there should be more because I want to continue reading about this universe. And despite all of the minor flaws that it might have, I think that that alone is enough to really propel it. I, I personally, I, get, I gave this fic five stars. I give it four and a half blueberry muffins. <laughs> All right, well, that's, what, that's, it for, that's it for that. I gave it five stars. Moonlight here, he gave it four and a half. Um, hopefully, you, you'll join us for further reviews of the fanfics here in the fanfic review corner. Once again, I'm Brush and Bones. And I'm Moonlight. And onwards and upwards, everyone. Thanks again, Moonlight and Bones and fans. Get fic reading. Solar Imperialists, cover your ears. It's Luna's New Republic by Cyril befriending Euro Beat Brony and Not a Clever Pony.
That's all for this first podcast of Everfree Radio. I want to thank Sockware for providing much-needed lowbrow inspiration and highbrow online profiles, and Lord Leauer for being Australian. Enough said. Thanks to Skipsy, aka for Married, for his uncannily good biscuits and artistic expertise, and Oatmeal for his succinct terseness. Thanks again to my co-hosts Moonlight, Autumn Spice, Crescendo, and Bones for their invaluable input, hours and hours of background research, and their creativity. And best of all, their endless, infinite ham. Thanks to our producers, One Trick and Discord. Without them, our internet tubes would clog. This show could not have come together or sound so polished without their experience and guidance. Once again, this is your host, Final Draft. Thanks for tuning in, and keep your ears open for our special episode to Halloween Spectacular on October 31st. Good night, and good luck. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some chaos to wreak.